Democratic State Representative Evan Goyke represents the 18th Assembly District in the city of Milwaukee, and he's a newsmaker for a few reasons. He's kind of become the face of first-term lawmakers from Milwaukee. He ran for Assembly Democratic leader and lost yesterday. So it's, and we didn't get a chance during the campaigns to interview the gentleman from the 18th. Evan, welcome to Wisconsin Eye. Thanks for having me. When you ran for leadership yesterday, in your speech you said, we are not victims. I want to ask you to explain that. Uh, and the context is that Assembly Democrats lost three seats. They're down, it looks like, 63-36 when the Assembly convenes in January. You're running for the top job as, uh, as Assembly Democratic leader. We are not victims. Why did you say that? Uh, there are political forces uh, in America and Wisconsin that are beyond our control. There's outside money, uh, as a result of Citizens United, that point was made yesterday. Correct. Uh, tough political maps after redistricting in 2012. Second force. Second force. Uh, a, a national red wave, a, a Republican sweep across the country. Uh, that th those are things beyond our control. Uh, but I I don't believe that our our caucus as victims of any of that, and I don't think that our focus should be on those things that are outside of our control. I think our focus should be on what we can do to overcome them. The districts are the districts. The outside money has existed for a long time and it will exist into the future until the Supreme Court you know, uh, changes its course. Uh, political waves come and go, uh, but we aren't uh, incapable of, of moving ourselves. Uh, we're not. Uh, lost in that wind. We have, we, we are able to push ourselves in our own direction. And so uh, if you have a mentality like there are these outside forces, oh, what can I do? And you put your hands up, um, you're much less effective. And I want to push my colleagues. I recognize those outside forces. I'm not saying they don't exist, but let's, let's go. Let's, let's start talking about what we can do to counter them. Um, you know, Tuesday was already a week ago. You got to have a short-term memory in the, in politics, and I'm ready to talk about how do we counter those forces in the future. Representative Dana walks in nominating uh, the the current and future Democratic leader, Peter Barca, said um, Citizens United and the influx of big money. First of all, most of that, most of the third third party money is against you Democrats. Correct. 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 Okay. How do you answer that? Do you go about, as you think of 2016, 2018, 2020, when that legislature will draw the next set of lines, do you go out and try to find funders of your own Democratic third party groups? Yeah, certainly, you have to fight fire with fire. Are they I, out there? Yes, they are out there. Uh, and I think in this last election, we saw most f uh, of, of the Democratic groups uh, helping the top of the ticket. And uh, the, in the assembly, we're, we're never going to be the top of the ticket. You know, we're up every two years, and there's always going to be a Republican and a Democrat above us. Uh, you know, but Steve, I, I, in my Democratic primary in 2012, there was outside money from the school vouchers uh, going after me. And it will be in the, that, that's going to continue to happen in the future. And so one of the things we need to do um, to counter that is, is not just, it's not just about finding our own allies that can, uh, that can uh, add resources, but it's having an effective counterpunch. How do we define ourselves as Democrats before the onslaught of money comes? Because if you look at when the outside money came in and really hit those legislative districts, it was, in the, it was towards the end of, of the campaign. And buckets and buckets of money came into these um, uh, districts. But, we, but you're we, not naive. You didn't see that coming? Your team didn't oh, see we, it coming I, in the Steve Smith district? And I could have told you district? it was coming. Okay. And so the, it, w it's going to happen. We know that's going to happen. So how do we have candidates that are prepared for those attacks? And uh, in my opinion, uh, one of the things that we need to focus on doing as a Democratic Party and as a, as a caucus in the Assembly is having our candidates defined by a, a progressive and positive legislative agenda and, and, and to connect personally with their districts uh, before a hundred flyers f printed in Washington, D.C. 
um, come to the North Woods trying to define that candidate in a different light. You're a Democratic candidate starting with Mary Burke who ran a credible campaign for governor, first Absolutely. woman to run a credible campaign. And uh, Peter Barca and Chris Larson focused on the jobs issue. Is that, was that a misplaced agenda, Evan? No, I, I, I think the, the agenda of our, of our economy as a whole and uh, the lack of job creation that we've had in Wisconsin is the number one issue. But what I think what we lost is uh, it's not enough to just say we need more jobs. You have to have, uh, comma, this is how we get there. And, and what I think didn't connect in the kitchen tables across the state of Wisconsin was I, I think families agreed that there was, uh, that we that we need, uh, you know, a stronger economic development and, and more jobs in Wisconsin. I don't think that is anyone, anyone um, disagrees with that, but how were Democrats going to get that done? And, you know, Mary Burke did have an, a very credible economic development agenda, which of course was immediately co-opted by, you know, the story of a staff person um, cutting and pasting it. So what was lost in that was the content. I don't really care where those ideas come from. They're good ideas. The reality was that if the reality is if Wisconsin were to implement some of them, we'd have more success economically. We'd have better growth economically. Aren't you kind of making the what's wrong with Kansas argument that many what should be Democratic voters in the rural areas and their turnout was down in the city of Milwaukee, correct? Uh, I believe so, although in my neck of the in woods okay. uh, we were at, at uh, above normal midterm levels. Okay, but my point is, are you making the what's wrong with Kansas argument that in some cases, um, what should be Democratic voters re-elected Governor Walker and returned the uh, bigger majority in the state assembly and your party lost one in the state senate? Yeah, well, and, and, and it, it, it's frustrating. We had ballot initiatives in Marathon County and Outagamie County and Winnebago County that where voters endorsed raising the minimum wage or removing money from politics or accepting the Badger Care expansion uh, federal dollars, yet voted for candidates that ha campaigned on doing the opposite. And so there is some frustration there, and I and, and so part of it is a bit of a head scratcher. But what I I think the diagnosis is that those Democratic candidates we 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 as a party didn't connect, we didn't connect the dots. So in, in part it's how do we communicate, but I don't think the voters believed they liked that policy, but they didn't see us strong enough on it. Okay, so the connect wasn't there. Correct. Um, Talk to me about your district. Give us a, a quick a summary of the 18th district. Uh, it's intensely urban. It is the, I think, the second smallest district in the state of Wisconsin. It's just over 3,500 acres. And the unemployment rate among African Americans massive, is what? Massive, massive. I have, I have uh, zip codes that have above 50 percent unemployment. Um, but it is, in, it, it, it is incredibly diverse, one of the most diverse places. I have 18-year-olds uh, just starting their college education at Marquette uh, University. I have uh, areas that have been economically depressed for a generation, and affluence as well. Uh, it is, I have incredibly integrated neighborhoods. People often talk about segregation in the city of Milwaukee, and if, if, you, if we could do a show in my district, I would love to show you the block I live on. That's a good idea. Which is incredibly integrated. We could do it in my house. I'd okay. invite you to the 18th Assembly District. It would be great. Let me ask you this question. You're now uh, finishing your first term. You've had a lot of interaction with Assembly Republicans. Are they in touch with the issues in the 18th Assembly District? Or, I'm sorry to ask it this way, do they just, it's not an issue of major concern with them? Um, I, uh, yes and no, and I'll try to be as specific as possible. I have seen my Republican colleagues make great strides on criminal justice reform, understanding that Wisconsin leads the nation in its disproportionate incarceration of African Americans. Yes, leads the and, nation. And leads the nation. And uh, that is a scarlet letter that we should fight to remove immediately. And You've we been able it. to make your Assembly uh, Republicans I, more sensitive and aware of that issue? Exactly. Are we going to see an initiative of that in the next budget? There are items in the Republic Assembly Republicans forward agenda that are really exciting on that front. Okay. Uh, the issue of foreclosed and abandoned homes. You just said you can work with assembly, uh, with assembly GOPers on that issue. I'm going to. Okay. 
Excuse and me, and, I, and I'm the vice chair throughout the, the summer. I was the vice chair of a legislative study committee with Gary Byes and other assembly Republicans uh, on treatment alternative and diversion funding in the state. And okay. so, it, and, and our new attorney general, Brad Schimmel, addressed uh, assembly Republicans on at their caucus on Monday and said that he's in favor of treatment courts and um, diversions from the criminal justice system. So that's an area where uh, we, we We've created great relationships across the aisle. You and sound hopeful on that issue. Very. Okay. And then the uh, other issue? Foreclosed and foreclosure? abandoned property. This summer, Steve, we did a tour of some neighborhoods in my district and adjacent to it, and 11 Republicans in the legislature came to the central city of Milwaukee. We took a tour and we saw the effect of boarded up properties on a block, and we had lunch in my house. Uh, I, very conservative Republicans eating at my dining room table, and we went and toured the property right next door. The house I live next to is a board up. And we got in and we look, walked around, and I think what they were able to see is, one, there's good, hardworking people in the city of Milwaukee that uh, deserve some help, that are trying to fight to save you know, these neighborhoods and their, their homes next door, and two, that the, that the houses are really worth saving. So I'm, I'm excited to come back and work on that issue. Now, those are exciting places to work together. I think that you've see, that we've heard some uh, a narrative about our social safety net that is incredibly troubling, and drug when, testing drug people testing to stay on public assistance disproportionately and negatively impacts my community. So well, we're, we're, it's going to be very hard to work across the aisle on issues like that. Milwaukee is burying a five-year-old who was shot to death in the arms of her grandfather today. Was that in your district? Uh, just outside. Just outside. Can you work with them on the violence issue, or does that become a Second Amendment debate, um, Representative? I'm afraid that it, it may, it may um, devolve into a Second Amendment, uh, Second Amendment debate, but we don't, we don't have to make it that way. I, I think that might be an excuse that's used 12 months from now as to why we can't pass meaningful legislation to stop the violence. And, and l let me tell you, it is the number one concern of my constituents. And I'm telling you that as someone that lives in the central city, it is my number one concern uh, in, in my neighborhood. And I think there are areas where we can reach across the aisle. Uh, one, one area that I think we're going to be successful on, how do we deal when, when, a, when a young girl is shot on a playground or a five-year-old on her grandfather's lap, how does the community around that source of violence, that, uh, how do they heal and move forward? Uh, and in too many places in Milwaukee, the, you know, kids are expected to you know, duck under the police tape on their way across the playground into their school and there aren't the resources there to wrap up those young children and heal that trauma so that they can grow and flourish and so uh, you know trauma-informed care and responding you know to to the collateral victims of in the community that see and witness this violence is an area that we don't have to talk about guns we don't have to talk about gun ownership or the Second Amendment it's but it is about resources uh, and, and but I think there's a way to to work there that we can find a follow-up question on the, this issue. You're, you're a lawyer and you do some defense work. Every time Wisconsin I interviews Chief Flynn, Milwaukee Police Chief Flynn, he says uh, he uses the interview to say we need tougher laws on somebody with a criminal record caught with a gun. Why can't those laws pass? Well, we have to be really careful on those tougher laws because uh, we don't want to scoop up people that aren't uh, y using the weapon inappropriately. So. I have in my career represented a pizza delivery driver who uh, was in possession of a gun under a seat because he'd been the victim of two armed robberies. Did he have a CCW permit or was this prior to this, that? This was prior to that and he had a two decade old felony for a nonviolent offense. So should that person who wasn't using the weapon, should he be automatically sent to prison? And. Chief Lynn might say, yes, given the tragic, we lose five-year-olds, uh, ten-year-olds shot on playgrounds and five-year-olds in the grandfather's and, life. And, and I think we're smart enough to figure out how we can make the distinction and 
hold accountable and punish very severely the people that use weapons and, and, are, are, and, and are tearing our community apart, but not scooping up people that are not doing that. And I think that, I, I think that we'll be able to strike that balance. The bridge and the gap, philosophically, between you and Assembly Republicans on these issues, voucher and choice, expansion of MA, drug testing to receive public benefits, um, the problems of NPS, is that a bridgeable gap on those issues, Evan? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. And I'll propose... Are you afraid of what's going to come out in the next budget? Yeah. In term yes. Why? Uh, well, what's your greatest fear? That my colleagues don't fully understand the landscape that they're hoping to change. Uh, it's not enough to tour one school or two schools. Uh, I have, uh, in the last session I had uh, roughly 44 schools in my district and it was a patchwork of public charter choice. And before we change anything in, in MPS or in the voucher program or the charter program, I'd like my Republican legislative colleagues to come to my community and see that spectrum. There are good voucher schools, there are bad voucher schools. There's good MPS schools, there are bad MPS schools. And before we just, uh, before Madison writes the rules, I think it's incredibly important that my colleagues see all of those. I'm happy to, I'll drive them around. I mean, this is, this is the way uh, that I have tried to bridge the gap, which is to open my door, my home, my community, because if they could see what's going on, I don't, if, if Wisconsin voters could see the reality uh, that, that we have and what has happened in, in the school system in Milwaukee uh, since the vouchers have uh, exploded, uh, th there's no way they would hit the gas pedal on this and, and expand vouchers. Coming from an inner city district, why did you ask to serve on the Assembly Agriculture Committee? Well, it's, <laughs> it's a, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, my constituents, um, you know, we eat the food that's grown in Wood County or Clark County, and it's and and and, and in my, my constituents brew the beer that's consumed in Clark County and Wood County. So we have this connection. Um, I wanted to work with pragmatic, uh, you know, so-called moderates uh, that it largely, I think, farmers that come to the legislature have that mentality, and I really, it was really a, a joy to get to know those members. But it's a connection. Um, food and growing food in, in ha, has been a uniter in my community. The, the growth of urban agriculture and um, community gardens have been ways that we bring uh, different backgrounds together, uh, different ethnic backgrounds, different um, generational backgrounds, and our connection to um, cooking and eating and knowing where that food comes from is really powerful. I'm also exploring ways so that my community can see the wide open spaces that are uh, available in Wisconsin. It's, it's really important and, and vice versa so that the folks in the rural community can come and experience what life is like uh, in, the, in the central city and, and what we'd find is that we're not very different at all. Where are you in the National Democratic Party debate on whether the president is an asset or a liability? Well, he's, he's what you want to make of him, right? If you run away from him, he's a liability. Yes. And if you run towards him, he's an asset. So it's not about the president. It's about how does the candidate e embrace what's happening. So President Obama and the two visits by his spouse uh, helped Mary Burke in the city of Milwaukee? Yes. And I got to meet the first lady, and she is amazing. And I have a picture of my fiancé and I, and it will, it's on our refrigerator. It was an asset. Okay. Um, draw me... Uh, a plan of how your party comes back in the assembly so perhaps you're in control in 2020 when the next lines are drawn. How do you get there from here? And, and that election is uh, my legacy election. That, that's what, what I do today uh, is, is with, it, with the plans and the strategy in place for that election. That is my legacy election. Uh, we need to come up with new solutions and new public policy. We need to challenge our own party to grow and diversify. We, I, I believe we've for too long abandoned ideas, uh, public policy ideas that we should own like tax reform, economic development, agriculture. Uh, issues around the state, sand mines, and water quality. You know, I was on the campaign trail in Kiwani County and uh, Portage and Wood County. Mm -hmm. 
the people, there are towns in Wisconsin that aren't using their tap water. And Democrats are in a position to solve that problem. That's uh, Kiwanee County? Kiwanee County. And uh, it, it, I think things are going to come home in communities that have leaned a Republican for a long time. And the solution for those problems are going to be proposed by legislative Democrats. Are you saying that Leggies, well, my question is, who should lead your party, given the fact that uh, Scott Walker was elected, won the fir third election for governor in um, four years, and Senate Democrats lost one, you guys lost three. Who should lead your party, the Wisconsin Democratic Party? Well, certainly I thought <laughs> that I should be one of those leaders. Yeah, uh, but you finished but second. <laughs> I finished second. Uh, I, I don't have anyone in mind uh, in particular, but what I hope happens uh, in the process is if, if I, I hope there is as many new ideas that come to the table, and I hope that, uh, and whether that's Chairman Tate or others that step forward, uh, that their focus is not just on the X's and O's of elections, but really on the content and the principles of the Democratic Party of Wisconsin. And I've, I've said before that's a bit of a return to our roots, which we should be incredibly proud of, but it's also being brave and bold in developing new ideas uh, in, in, in addressing the challenges that we face in the next 20 years. And then the final question, what about you personally? Uh, you're not going to be the Assembly Demo Democratic leader. You can, you can kind of pull back or you can stay high profile, active and engaged. Your, your personal path? I'm not going anywhere. Uh, I've got a couple of exciting things on the home front. We were talking before we went on air. I just got engaged and my fiance, thank you, she is uh, smarter and significantly better looking than me so I'm going to execute this wedding as fast as I possibly can and uh, and and I look forward to that I've got so many exciting ideas for the 18th Assembly District um, both on the large-scale public policy but also on the physical space and and building coalitions within the city and the county and the state um, to better the physical space uh, of the 18th Assembly District I'm coming back uh, pedal to the metal. I'm not going anywhere. Um, obviously, I wish the results were yesterday were different, um, but I, I love my job. This is what I dreamed of doing since I was a child, and I'm, I'm coming back uh, with more energy and more positivity than I had last session, and, uh, and, and I can't wait. So you'll be given, even though you challenged the, um, the incumbent Democratic leader and lost, you're confident you'll be given a chance to raise these issues and passions and concerns in the next two years? I, I believe so. And, and, I, I, and I think some of the relationships that I've developed on the other side of the aisle uh, put me in a good position to do so. And, and yesterday was a good day. It, it wasn't negative. It wasn't personal. It was a good day for our caucus. And we are unified going forward. It was a close election, but it was a good election. And I'm not going anywhere. And uh, I look forward to working as hard as I possibly can. Democratic State Representative Evan Goyke represents the 18th Assembly District in Milwaukee. Evan, thanks for visiting with the Wisconsin Eye. Thank you for having me. Thanks.